Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to uh, reflect on the research we did in the past. I think this uh, uh, replication study is very rewarding. Um, having been doing uh, or being part of this research 25 years ago, uh, triggers my curiosity to figure out, can we, can you replicate this and how will of course the result be? Will it be the same or will there be nuances in it? I think there will be a lot of uh, new elements uh, adding on to this research. Um, and I will try to share a little bit of this uh, and my thoughts on this uh, in this talk. I will also want to say that uh, it may look like a little bit of an art historical survey I'm offering you, but there is a, an idea with it. And I would have hoped that this one would move forward. I have a, a number of issues that I want to discuss. What was the situation in uh, 1998? What were the first observations, second phase, third phase, and fourth phase? I will simply walk you through them one by one. The problem was that when we started, knowledge about Rembrandt's painting techniques were limited to a core group of Rembrandt researchers that were kind of setting the scene for what Rembrandt's techniques would be. In the Corpus of Rembrandt Paintings, a volume that was uh, published in 1982, it is said uh, with a quote from Herbert von, uh, Hubert von Sonnenberg, a curator and conservator in Germany and later at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, that nothing is known either from sources or from other kinds of examination of any kind of underdrawing in Rembrandt's paintings. So this was the established knowledge at the time. Um, Art van Gelder's painting was kind of used as an illustration of, here you see the artist in the studio, his props, his uh, materials, nothing is known about uh, these drawings. However, it's interesting that Rembrandt was trained by Peter Lustmann. Peter Lustmann uh, in Leiden, about him, they said no traces have been found in Rembrandt's Leiden panels, again, referring to the, uh, what you've just seen from uh, Charlotte, of any other drawing like we see in Rubens paintings or which we have seen in one of Lustmann's paintings. It is not this painting here that's referred to in this quote, but Lustmann's painting shows extensive underdrawing, all these black lines here. So Rembrandt is trained by an artist that uses a lot of underdrawing. Interestingly, uh, in 1995, uh, uh, six and seven, uh, a colleague of mine and I restored this painting by Rembrandt. We didn't detect any kind of underdrawings whatsoever, but we did look into the painting techniques and a paint cross section, as you see here at the top, where we have part of the ground layer and some underpaint in the brown spots that you see. I don't know if I can show it on uh, this one doesn't really want to move because there is this pointer over here. I think. Pointer. These brown uh, layers that you see here in between the lower gray and the upper light color is the not underdrawing, but the underpaint that Rembrandt seems to employ. And we know that from some of his early paintings where the uh, so-called uh, dote fair, the first layers are being put in and the details you see to the left is from this particular painting, the Concord of the State from 1641, where you see an artist that starts out with a brown paint in a loose hand, sets down the scene and begins to fill in shadows and with highlights with a lighter paint. This is the way that we believed in 1998 that Rembrandt would exercise his, uh, his painting. Now, the first observations, they were shocking as you already saw from Salat. The two paintings were being examined. Uh, well, the Maritz House painting was under scrutiny in combination with both a uh, catalog uh, of the uh, portrait paintings in the Maritz House and in preparation for the exhibition of the Rembrandt self-portraits. However, as also already mentioned, a German art historian, Klaus Grimm, already in 1991, questioned whether the two paintings attributions should be reversed, because based on a number of observations, but also on the x-rays of the two paintings, where the one to the right is the Nuremberg painting, where you see a much more 
patchy way of dancing with the brush over the surface, then you see that more smooth painting that you have uh, to your left, which is from the Maratabs. His arguments were not regarded as valid at the time. It was kind of rejected. And therefore, uh, preparations were made for the uh, Maratabs painting to become uh, even the poster or affiche for the exhibition. However, Karlin van der Elster, a colleague in the Maratau studio, did a routine infrared imaging of the Maratau painting. And that is when this underdrawing uh, with the very wild curls, and you see him here close by, you see a second pair of eyes that's also been drawn in, the eye lines here, the lips, everything is very carefully drawn. Now, as we have learned from the corpus of the Rembrandt uh, studies, Rembrandt didn't work this way, although he was trained to do this. We had to reflect and reconsider. And therefore, a study was made, and Edwin Bowser, I, uh, Fritz de Park, the then director, Christopher White from London, a scholar, went to Nuremberg with a number of uh, scientific people that could examine paintings and do infrared imaging, also of the Nuremberg painting. Adrie Verbeur was the one who did this. And you can see the difference. There is an underdrawing in the one in the Marat house. There's no underdrawing here. But there's another difference, uh, which I will come back to in a minute. There is, just for the sake of the case, there's a third version in Copenhagen, painted on a piece of oak that comes from the same period. So it could have been also there. It's a horrible painting, very Habsburgan in its appearance. Uh, there is a little trace of underdrawing in it, uh, but it is, and there are even more versions out there, I believe. So having these three next to each other um, was uh, what prompted further, further thinking. Now I had to do, um, we agreed on at the Marat House, extra research. And I traveled around the world to look at Rembrandt paintings because the results of this meant that a number of paintings changed attribution. Because the painting at the MOM Museum in Japan, which is very clearly painted the same way as the Marat House painting, very smoothly, was thought to be original. And the one, the replic in uh, Indianapolis, was thought to be a copy. Also, this reversed with this study and with the discovery of the Maratos painting not being the original. Infrared imaging also showed no uh, underdrawing in the painting in Indianapolis that you still have here. But an aspect that I didn't touch upon before, uh, but I will mention to you now is that the shadow area of the face is a very patchy area in the painting. It's very splotchy, not very uh, opaquely painted, which seems to be a characteristic of the early Rembrandt, contrary to many of the other paintings we looked at. Here are another couple of paintings, and you can see the, the uh, painting in the uh, Rijksmuseum to your left is debated still, I believe, but we have had images made of that one. Here is, of course, a hor another horrible version, again in Denmark, I'm afraid. <laughs> so we got the bad ones. Uh, but here you see an infrared image of the, of the Rijksmuseum painting. And again, this very, very open structure in the shadow area of the face. Something that, in my view, could point towards uh, the authorship of, uh, of Rembrandt. Um, I'll just mention that in 1658, and William Sanderson wrote, an imitator does never come clear to the first author, unless by excellent modern masters' own works, uh, or, um, uh, but they come always short in truth, which is the things in themselves, the copier being forced to accommodate himself to another man's intent. This is maybe also something to reflect upon in replication studies. A painting again uh, in the Rijksmuseum and its copy of Replik in uh, Kassel. That again looks different also in the infrared image. So this is a kind of a second phase where a number of paintings from the period, the early period, paintings also by artists influenced by Rembrandt, Kre Dao was Rembrandt's first student. There is underdrawing in Dao's paintings, these two small medallions from, uh, from Kassel. But Jan Liefens is not having any underdrawing, uh, but is very opaquely painted, as are the Daos. Again, different from the way that Rembrandt seems to paint, very shorthand, very open in the structure. 
So this leads to kind of a, a third phase, in my study at least, broadening the scope, uh, trying to look at more paintings. And we have uh, two early Rembrandts again, uh, no underdrawing, check, that is apparently what we see all the time. Also in the Susanna, there is a lot of scratching in the wet paint, no curls, no curvatures like in the underdrawing in the Maratage painting, but more kind of etchy curvatures. Um, and there may be kind of traces of an underdrawing in the corpse of Susanna. There's a line going along here. It could also just be a scratch in the ground layer on which the paint has been applied. There's another painting here of Saskia, uh, but now suddenly we go a little bit closer to Saskia's face, you can see there is trace of a small uh, drawing here. So if this painting is genuinely by Rembrandt, then apparently he does uh, ap apply this technique. Others of his students, like uh, Carl Fabricius, didn't use an underdrawing either. We have studied them. We can see that he is having a very broad brushwork like his uh, master Rembrandt would have used it. Also uh, indicating in a brushwork again, the leaves of the shoes, uh, of the leaves next to the shoes of, uh, uh, of the lady. However, even though we have established and written extensively about this uh, over the years, new paintings pop up, new replicas, and here a whole series of paintings by Rembrandt or like Rembrandt, wannabe Rembrandt's, uh, the one at the Hermitage was rejected as being by Rembrandt by the Corpus. Um, and the Göteborg painting was known to be a replic. The Hermitage version number two is also known to be a replic. Nobody doubted that in the museum either. But in Rome, there was a painting that popped up just two years ago. It fell from the wall, was restored, and they came up with a huge uh, press release. They have found the original master for the other three ones. This is the principal, according to the Rome researchers. Apparently have been overlooked that in 2014, the Rembrandt Research Project re-evaluated uh, their own uh, uh, judgment on the Hermitage painting to the left, uh, which is now regarded as the prototype. Well, the Roman scholars believe that theirs was, it had such an extensive underdrawing, so they were completely convinced that this is exactly the way Rembrandt would exercise an underdrawing. Although we have just shown, I believe, that he didn't do that. The last phase of this um, ongoing research is not published yet, but will be in September this year. And that is looking closer again at the early phases of Rembrandt's paintings, also self-portraits like this one. And what you will see in this infrared image, which didn't come out, but it will come here, is that there is a, a striking element. There is a patchiness in the shadow area. There's no underdrawing, but there is a very dark shadow <clears throat> in the white of the eyes. The white eyeballs are black in infrared imaging. Now, infrared imaging, just for, the, for, the, for those of you who don't know it, can uh, absorb um, the infrared, image, uh, infrared light is absorbed where there is carbon black present in a painting. Something that absorbs the infrared and where it's reflected, that's where we see. That's why we see an underdrawing in a charcoal or, uh, or chalk, uh, because it absorbs the infrared radiation. This means that this painting by Rembrandt has got black pigment added to the white of the eyeballs. Is this now something unique? Well, these two portraits have the same thing. The man has also a very clearly black paint in the white of the eyeballs. The lady less where the light is falling from a different angle on her face. It's been very difficult to figure out if any of the other artists did so, but Dow didn't do that. Jan Lievens didn't do this. And all the other painters that I have studied in the past, from the very beginning in 1998 and until now, follow a pattern that seems to be coinciding with this. I've heard no recipes about this, but methods of painting faces are, are quite rare. And I'll show you here. To begin a picture, first draw the eye, the white thereof, make a white let with a little charcoal black. 
the only reference I've been able to find on how to paint a white eyeball or paint an eyeball at all. And that seems to be the way that Rembrandt does it. And in these two paintings, there might be, I have only the bad image from 1998, but I am hoping that new research will show up that maybe this is also the case with this detail of the Nuremberg painting compared to the Maratage painting where it doesn't show that way. Rembrandt replicates himself all the time, apparently, or other people replicate Rembrandt. Uh, it therefore becomes difficult to, uh, to understand who did what, when, and what is the time difference between the first version, the principal version, and the second version. Being in the conservation business and working with colleagues in, in uh, art history, I think we'd, we are used to uh, asking the question, is the research we've done valid? Can it be replicated? And I would argue, for the sake of case, that the studies I have published over the years, based on the study we did in 1998, Edwin, I, and the other colleagues at the, at the museum, has kind of circulated about using that initial research to see it, are there other aspects of the way that this artist paints that kind of leads us into understanding um, and forcing us to revise some of the things that we have been doing in the past. Um, in 2001, I was invited to the Getty Museum by, by John Walsh, the then director, to participate in a discussion about uh, what were the failures and successes in painters conservation. I will uh, not share my, my successes in this, but I will share what I regarded at the time as a little bit of a failure. Because in doc documenting this discovery of 1998 and comparing it with the other, other paintings, that made me want to go further with the research, but also with what I said here, the painting of the mouse is still on display, but now with the attribution anonymous. The painting will probably have to wait a considerable period of time before uh, it's uh, being restored. And retreatment would, at the time, not be accepted by the then director, unfortunately, but it would have generated a lot of new evidence that could have made our arguments at that time probably stronger than it was. I put it here in my writing that was a the, the current guesswork has succeeded in doing, there was not much guesswork in it, mm -hmm. but we were trying to emulate and, and uh, understand uh, various views, also various scholars' views on the Rembrandt paintings. So with this, I would like to thank a lot of people uh, for having participated in this uh, research in the past, and uh, without those, it wouldn't have been possible to uh, reflect on this here today. I'm looking very much forward to be, be completely x-rayed by uh, <laughs> the research that's going on in Nuremberg next week. I know that a lot of new research, new techniques, new machines, new technologies are available today. And I'm very curious to see if we have to revise our review of the uh, Maratage painting, or if it still uh, is having the same status as we have uh, concluded in 1998. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, may I ask you to take a seat? It's fantastic to have you, Sherlock.